Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Gordon Rothstein. I'm uh, one of the surgeons here at St. Michael's Hospital, but my other role here is to uh, uh, direct the Keenan Research <coughs> Center, which is our research center for basically a fundamental type of search here at St. Michael's Hospital. The philosophy of our research center here is to do uh, basic research, basically at the bench, uh, and uh, have an expectation that that research will have some clinical implications. And the good news is that we have a hospital right across the road from here, so we can actually take discovery that we have over here in the Kena Research Center and take it across the road to uh, St. Michael's Hospital. We call that bench to bedside research, and that's kind of a theme that we follow through this lecture series. So this is called our popular science lecture series. Um, this is actually the last one of the academic year. We run from September through to May. Uh, I want to start off by recognizing Ashley Rosen, who has uh, coordinated this. You've probably seen her. <laughs> I, I was telling her she, she built this lecture series from just a small kernel to a, a, a full-blown program now. So thank you very much. You've done a great job doing that. Um, and uh, I'd like to welcome people from all over the city. I know we have uh, uh, several um, high school students here. We have uh, Upper Canada College. We have uh, St. Michael's uh, uh, Choir School. Um, we have St. Michael's University. And Ashley Wells? Crescent and Crescent School. We have one student from Crescent School today. Um, <coughs> we just started our summer research program here at St. Michael's Hospital that we run every summer. Um, and uh, so we have a lot of students who are here as part of our uh, Kena Research Center summer research program. Uh, they're mostly students uh, who are uh, people between first and second year or second and third year university, and they're coming here to get a, uh, a basically an exposure to research here at St. Michael's Hospital. So uh, I'm gonna uh, ask the, the students who are still in high school to keep that in mind because uh, next year it's a good opportunity to get to know people around here and use that as a segue into possibly doing some summer research opportunities here. Uh, we have uh, uh, people from the volunteer service, so welcome. Uh, uh, we love having you here to this. And we have a few other people here. Uh, I don't know everybody, but a lot of them I do know. So it's really an honor for me today to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Tom Schweitzer. So um, I, I think it would be an understatement to suggest that we save the best for last. Uh, but the first time I heard Tom speak, I was knocked off my seat. Uh, because the work was so interesting and really so exciting. You may have seen him in the, uh, was it the Star, the Globe and Mail, or both? Both, yeah. Both. Um, he's modest, too. Uh, and uh, and uh, the Daily Mail. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I have to start by taking a poll here. Uh, who here uses a uh, hands-free telephone when they're in their car? Okay. Come on, you can put your hands up. Okay. Uh, who here uh, does not use hands-free, just puts the phone to your ear? I'm a policeman in my sideline, so uh, <laughs> thank you, step aside. Uh, and um, so uh, Tom has some really interesting data about, uh, about driving. He runs a driving simulator here at the hospital and does research related to that. Uh, he's going to give you the details, but I, I think you're going to find this really interesting. This is really where you get kind of practical day-to-day -day life, like driving, uh, intersecting with um, really high-tech biology, which is really advanced imaging, which is the work that Tom and his colleagues do here at St. Michael's Hospital. So I, I won't give away the punchline, Tom. I'll let you take it away, and thanks very much for speaking today. Great, sure, thank you. Okay, let me get, uh, get right into it. I've got a little bit of a, a road map here that we're going to follow for the duration of the talk. I'm going to start by kind of grounding in some context, and particularly going to focus on two target groups, teens, how many people here are in the teenage years? Yeah, okay, Ori, yeah, perfect. Okay, and then in the elderly group, and you'll see as to why I'm focusing on those two groups. Then we're gonna talk about the issue of assessing fitness to drive. So basically that is going through a set of tests to determine can you actually operate a vehicle or not. I'm gonna tell you right now that is completely flawed and hopefully this research in five, 10 years from now is actually gonna come up to some answers and, and tests that will be better used to or serve to assess fitness to drive. Then we're gonna talk about some of the new research in fMRI, that's a magnetic resonance imaging, except this, and I'll, I'll, I'll ground it in the, in the context and the technology itself, where you're actually performing a task and then we can look at the brain as it's firing. There's some interesting research questions. 
new findings that Ori talked about, some of the hands-free, and then a bit of discussion at the end. So I'm going to argue that driving is probably one of the most dangerous real-world tasks that we do on a daily basis. Thousands of pounds of metal hurtling down a road with lots of other distractions and other things that can keep your concentration unfocused at the task at hand. So there are many reasons why we're focusing on driving as a good real world task of interest. So this is the, the classic uh, U-shaped curve. So you can see this is crash involvement rate. And here's the reason why I'm focusing on teens and the elderly. You can see that there's a peak in the crashes in the teenage years that slowly starts to level off. And then at around the 70s, it starts to come right back up again. So there's something unique about the two ends of the spectrum that we're really trying to elucidate what the, what the factors involved in that are. And we think it's brain related, and I'll hopefully convince you of that as well. Here's another one in terms of not only crashes, but fatality rate. So that's taking it to the next level. These are people that are not obviously surviving uh, these crashes. And it's the same U-shaped curve that you see. Teenage years, it spikes, then it starts to level off and comes right back up again. So why, why, what are some of the risk factors associated in the teenage uh, teen driving? So if you're a male and you're teen, of teenage years, your risk between the ages of 16 and 19 are about two times that of female counterparts. I think that has to do with some potential uh, showing off or risk-taking behavior, maybe. I'm not sure, uh, but uh, that's one of the, uh, the theories. The other thing that is a huge risk factor is if a teenage driver has teenage passengers. So you can see the conversation outside of the vehicle going on, and then it seamlessly goes inside the vehicle and continues, despite the fact that they're now in charge of thousands of pounds of metal. And new lic newly licensed uh, teens are at particularly high risk in the first few months of uh, licensure. So now, what are the reasons or potential uh, factors that contribute to this? Well, there's several. So, and I'm going to argue that a lot, if not majority of the important ones, are brain related. So lack of experience, so that's learning, understanding how to operate a vehicle in different conditions, is not at peak in the teenage years. There's lots to be learned, um, and it's between the ages of 16 and 19, there's not a lot of life experience that has happened. There's poor judgment. Teens are more likely than older drivers to speed and allow shorter distances between the cars in front, and, uh, in, in front of them. So that's a judgment call, that's a frontally mediated, so frontal part of the brain task, um, that they're showing some judgment, uh, poor judgment. Brain development. So most people are not aware that to operate a vehicle, being able to focus your attention and multitask requires a fully developed frontal cortex. It just so happens, though, that doesn't fully mature and develop until your mid-20s. So we're giving keys to vehicle to 16, 17, 18-year-olds, and their frontal cortex has yet to fully develop and mature. So that's a, uh, we also believe is a significant contributing factor to this. And there's also a high risk of distractions. There's increased cell phone use, there's increased uh, discourse going on, there's increased texting going on uh, in the teenage population. So that's, that's the, the teenage group trying to account for why that front end of that U-shaped curve may be spiking. Now we're going to switch gears before I get into the imaging data to look at what's happening in the elderly population. And why is this equally important? Well, if you can look at this graph, you're going to see that the age wave is coming. By the year 2046, there's going to be a huge population of patient or individuals that are 75 and over. So it's going to be a, a critical issue. Already is, but it will be more so if we don't understand ways to better assess driving capacity. The projections, again, map onto the same thing. By 2026, there's going to be a huge spike of the collision rate in drivers within the ages of 65 to 85 and over. And then the casualty crash risk, crash risk in turn will follow that trend. So those are, are fairly alarming numbers um, for that particular population. 40% of fatal um, collisions of drivers 70 and older are occurring at intersections. So that's where a lot of accidents are happening. And we think that's happening because at that moment in time, at a left-hand turn, let's say, at a busy intersection, there's a tremendous amount of information that you have to take in and process and make a decision. 
So you have to look at the light ahead of you to make sure you're going to turn before it goes red. You've got to look at speeding oncoming traffic. And then you have to look at the pedestrians that are also crossing the road at the same time. So that, for somebody who doesn't have a fully developed frontal lobe, or in the elderly population has an atrophying, which means a shrinking frontal lobe, those could be problems. So you're going to, and that's in, in the context of a lot of other traffic around too. So we also, uh, there's data showing that uh, in, in the elderly, it's particularly bad in terms of contributing to relationship of where you are. I don't know how many accidents happen in a driveway, but apparently there's a, a little bit. <laughs> so it needed a little bit of a bar here, but uh, certainly intersection and the risk goes up as you age. So intersections are a problem for most, but particularly for elderly um, drivers. One of the contributing factors as well is a frontal lobe mediated task, which is a misjudging uh, of the uh, uh, vehicle in front and when they're going to be making a maneuver or getting enough stopping distance between their vehicle and the vehicle in front of them. So this is all just a point to the fact that driving, all aspects of driving aren't equal. There's certain aspects that are more difficult than others, and it looks like left-hand turn, particularly at a busy intersection, is one of the worst. And hopefully, and that's not just me saying that in the statistics, insurance and other things saying that, I'm going to show you the brain data that actually proves that that is entirely accurate. So again, just to summarize in terms of the public health concern of this issue in the elderly senior population, the, their, uh, uh, seniors in a crash are four times more likely to be seriously injured and hospitalized as a result, far more than the teenage up to 24 year olds. The treatment of these injuries in seniors are particularly complex, costly, and slower to recover. So returning to normal day to day function, returning without assist, that occurs at a much slower rate. And then most three quarters of these crashes are involving drivers uh, in multiple vehicle crashes. So that's a pretty huge thing. So they're not only hurting themselves, but they're having spectacular accidents, hurting a number of people uh, at the same time. So as we talked about potentially things that are going on in the teenage brain or the, in the teenage situation, how does aging affect driving safety? Well, there's a lot of physiological things that are happening in aging, in addition to potentially some brain-related uh, uh, changes. So there's certainly a reduction in their vision, uh, particularly night vision. Uh, like I said before, which may be a more brain-mediated process, there's a difficulty in judging distance and speed in relation to other vehicles. There's a, there's a motoric uh, issue of limited mobility, slowed reaction time, and a difficulty in focusing attention over a long time and being distracted fairly easily. So, uh, and then the use, which is increased uh, that compared to teens and the other population of over-the-counter medications that some may uh, and, or may not impair driving ability, that's still not known fully as to what, uh, what drugs or what class of drugs are the worst for impairing driving ability. The other big thing, again, pointing to this whole idea of brain changes in those two ends of the spectrum, there's no doubt uh, that older adults have more trouble multitasking. So is it a good thing that all these new vehicles speaking to you, having GPS, allowing you to you know, have the car read your emails to you, or having all sorts of knobs everywhere for the elderly driver? I would say absolutely, unequivocally, no. That is probably the worst thing you can do in those situations, uh, and particularly for that group. And there's no doubt research has shown, not in the context of driving, but in the context of other psychological research, that older, patient, older people, when interrupted after they're focused on a task, have a hard time getting back on track to the task, the primary task at hand. So you can think, if you're driving, that's your primary task. You get distracted. It's much harder for you to get back on track, but you have, you're still in that vehicle and driving. Um, that could be uh, posing a big problem. So now I'm going to talk about the issue getting out of the teenage, in the elderly group, and also in patient-related uh, work. And the issue here at hand is fitness to drive. So what does that mean? Well, that's basically going through tests at a certain age or after a certain injury to determine whether or not you should have your license back after that injury or after a certain age cutoff. And that is, a, is comprised of a mandatory written and vision test and a 90 minute group workshop every two years after the age of 80. Um, if anything shows any violation or collision involvement after the age of 80, then there's a mandatory road test 
that is also done. And the real striking and funny thing, I think, is that this is only done in Ontario and not other provinces. So here we're going to give you a very uh, extreme example, but an example nonetheless that is uh, from the uh, Toronto area of a 42-year-old mother that was uh, of three children returning home one evening. She was struck by an 84-year-old driver, and apparently that driver didn't hear the woman banging on the hood um, because she was lodged underneath the vehicle and dragged all the way to her driveway where she was finally dislodged, and the, uh, old, the elderly woman just walked into her home. Uh, not uh, having seen uh, what she had done. And here is the kicker. Uh, three months before that, she passed all of her tests to say that she was fit to drive. So clearly that's an extreme end of it. It doesn't all fit into that in such gruesome detail, but uh, clearly there's some flawed uh, aspects of these particular tests. And when you get out of the elderly aging group and you're moving into the medical, the clinical fields, the governing body of the Canadian Medical Association has thrown their hands up and said there's insufficient evidence to recommend for or against any specific testing method. For that to be a statement made by the governing medical body, that's quite telling. We're in a bit of a pickle. Regarding functional assessments, the lack of consensus on measurement of cognitive indicators continues to be a, uh, make this whole issue of fitness to drive a problematic issue. So, this is where I think we come in, at least a small piece of where we come in, is I think we're in this predicament because we don't fully understand the dynamic of the brain as it's performing this functional task, which could result in fatalities. So the basic science behind this issue hasn't been fully fleshed out. We've jumped ahead 10 paces without having done all the kind of background brain-related studies, I think. So that brings us to the questions about uh, driving. So the first question we had, which is the team that we have here at St. Mike's and graduate students at Biomedical Engineering at the University of Toronto, uh, working with myself and others, was can we pull off a driving simulation study using high-tech MRI equipment, the highest powered equipment that we can get, which we have available in the city, and put everything that we need, which is the full field of view, seeing the driving scene, a, a steering wheel, a brake and pedals into an MRI. So you have to remember an MRI is very magnetic. You can't have any metal into uh, the MR environment. So that may seem like it would be a very simple straightforward thing but it took us a year and a half to figure out in principle how to do it and collect usable data. Now once, so you, you can take my word for it, we did it. Uh, we can now move on to the next part which is other questions related to now having done that uh, uh, task and, and pulled that off successfully. Now we want to go do the basic science, which is, well, what areas of the brain are involved with different driving maneuvers? If you look at the statistics, driving straight should be different than making a left-hand turn at an intersection, as should be different for you actually being distracted if we can induce that in the MR environment. And we know, again, most accidents occur left-hand turn, busy intersection. So what does the brain look like when you're actually doing that? It should be different if that's causing problems. And then driving and talking on a cell phone. Um, is another issue and then potentially we may be able clo to get closer to answering a question about developing uh, better assessment methods down the line. So uh, I want to give a, a bit of uh, a crash course in MR. You could easily do a several, a series of lectures on understanding MR and what we're doing. So I am going to turn to our friends at YouTube. When someone suffers from an internal ailment that cannot be detected by a traditional office examination, an MRI may be necessary. When an MRI is administered, the patient lies on a retractable platform which enters the center of the machine. Upon entering the machine, the patient is scanned by one of several magnetic coils that emit a radio frequency pulse targeted at the specific region to be examined. This creates a magnetic field that runs down the center of the tube. There are billions of hydrogen atoms within the body, which rotate on a natural axis. When the magnetic current is introduced, the atoms align to it like a compass and spin on a new axis. When the magnetic force is removed, the atoms return to their natural alignment. As they relax, they emit energy and act as a small radio transmitter. Different tissues release different energy levels and the computer recognizes their distinct pulses. The difference in energy is determined by the atom's realignment time. Dense tissue takes longer to realign than soft tissue. 
So when the computer receives the different energy levels, it creates an image, which shows dense areas as white and less dense areas as black. With this procedure, the MRI can show organs, tendons, ligaments, etc. It is only because of the sheer number of hydrogen atoms in the body that MRI technology is possible. Okay, so that, that sum, sums up in a nice way, I think, exactly how MR generates the images that you typically see, what's referred to as a structural MRI of the brain. So now, what we're, so whenever I g give this talk, there's, there's a, a distinction between MRI, which is that, versus fMRI, and I'll get into what the, the differences are. So what we're talking about, and the research you're gonna see that we, we do here, we do structural as well, but what's really important from, is to get at that functional aspect. So functional meaning that you're in that same tube, but you're actually doing a task. And we're gonna see your brain light up in different areas, and the principle behind that is referred to as the blood oxygen level dependence, or BOLD signal. So it's, um, again, I can, I can probably whip through this fairly quickly. It's uh, playing around with a deoxygenated hemoglobin and oxygenated hemoglobin, an area of the brain that's actually working and firing to work and, and, and compute that task at hand will take up obviously more oxygen, and as a result of that, you're gonna be able to pick up that flow. So I'll show you again in a nice, very short, this one's much shorter. Simply put, the magnet tracks hemoglobin, the iron-rich protein that makes your blood red. When hemoglobin transfers oxygen to your tissues, a tiny change occurs in the hemoglobin's magnetic field. So basically, when your brain cells call for more oxygen, this big brother can see it. But it, it, it basically what I showed you in the picture, that's exactly what the MR is picking up. It's not the hydrogen changes, it's not the structural static image that you see, it's that in addition to the blood flowing in those different areas. Right? So here is a good uh, example of a fMRI experiment, a very classic fMRI experiment. So what you'll see is the, basically the top halfway through the head, the skull cut open to expose the head on a computer screen, and then you'll have a, uh, a specific task that is presented. You see no fire, very minimal firing. They're looking at nothing. Now watch, watch, watch what happens when they see something. Now they see there's about a three or so second lag, and so now all of this area is being shown as active while they're looking at this spinning wheel where before there was nothing there, right? So now you can see the, the task stops, those areas come offline. So there's no need for those areas just to stare at this black screen. Where they were kicked on, or where they actually were starting to work, was when that spinning wheel came on, and then you could see certain areas of visual cortex were needing more blood to actually compute that task. So that's a, that's a good uh, example there. Why are we using fMRI versus other technologies? Because there is such a thing as EEG, which is measuring electrical activity on the top of the scalp. There's other things, MEG, uh, which is a little bit more detailed and a little bit uh, more uh, kind of all-encompassing on the head. Or PET, which is the uh, process of looking at blood flow or, or changes in the brain, metabolic changes in the brain. But it's quite invasive. I have to inject a radioactive tracer into the body and wait until that gets into the brain f before I can actually do the experiments. And you're only, because it is radioactive, you're only limited a, a certain number of exposures to that. So not ideal. The benefit of fMRI is that it's non-invasive. There is no radioactive tracer. There's no injections. You just go into the magnet. Uh, it's increasingly available, most downtown centers. Now we have a research dedicated three Tesla magnet here, and there is extremely good spatial resolution, which is I can get down to the very specific structural areas like the hippocampus, which is a very tiny area in the middle of the temporal uh, cortex, and see that with great detail. The thing it does suffer from, as opposed to EEG, is the temporal resolution. By that I mean there is that three second lag as you saw in that video. Once the wheel was spinning, it took a little while for the actual lighting up to happen. That's because it takes a while to pick up that blood change and flow change in, about, in the order of about three seconds. But we know that's fairly constant. So mathematically we can actually do that and cancel that out as part of the processing pipeline. Um, and the good thing about fMRI is, in, in, unlike EEG or other technologies, EEG only can look at the superficial areas of cortex. With fMRI, we can go into the deep 
uh, subcortical structures and see how they're contributing to this network of activation. So now I hopefully convince you that fMRI is the task to, or the, the technology to use and that driving is interesting and there's a bunch of questions that we have that can be answered by using these technologies. So this is, uh, although it doesn't look like it maybe a year and a half worth of work from my graduate students to put everything into a three Tesla MRI environment. So you can see they're uh, in a lying down position of which we get them familiar with in practice situations where they're not in the magnet, they're outside getting comfortable. That's the caveat, it's not real driving. We know we're not in the state in technology where I can put you in your car and get you, put a helmet on you that will go along with you for the ride. That's not even close to happening. So this is as good as it gets to get good detail of brain activation. And so you can see here, this is the steering wheel, the head is here, the uh, torso, the hands rest nicely on the steering wheel, which is just happens to be a Nintendo Wii steering wheel because it's fully plastic, so it, it was already MR compatible. It was the other stuff, which was the brake accelerator and the brake uh, pedals uh, that were the tricky part, and then feeding all that into the virtual reality software to do the driving, and then uh, putting it into a computer. So this is what it looks like with the student inside the uh, magnet. Uh, you can see they're almost as though they're sitting in their cards as they're lying down and they're obviously in a tube um, as they're doing it, but they're in almost a sitting position with their feet comfortably on the brake and accelerator and their hands at the steering wheel. And basically there's a mirror there, so her full field of view is though she's looking outside a windshield. Uh, it's all covered by the driving scenario. This is the view from inside the magnet to show uh, that there's room, there's hands, uh, her hands are there operating the, um, the vehicle. And so that was, uh, like I said, a, a long time to validate, to make sure we can get usable data, to make sure that there wasn't any what's called task correlated head movement. So typically when you move your foot, your head kind of moves a little bit as well, and that's not good for fMRI because if you're, it's a moving target, it's very hard to get the structural um, uh, areas that are involved. So we did all of that and everything was successful. So now we wanted to pilot this on 16 healthy active, driving, uh, active drivers between the ages of 25 and 30. And that was a conscious effort because we wanted to stay away from the two spikes on the U-shaped curve. We wanted to get drivers that had enough experience to be able to operate the vehicle and we can get good, uh, hopefully, uh, reliable activation maps. So the first set of studies were to look at answering that one question, which was, are all driving maneuvers the same? And the answer, I think you'll be convinced, hopefully, that that's a full out no. But what we wanted to do was compare certain aspects, so more routine aspects of driving. So driving straight down a country road versus making a left-hand turn at a busy four-lane intersection. And then we wanted to do another uh, aspect of driving, which is getting them to drive and talking on a hands-free cell phone to see what happens to the brain on that. So this is the actual um, virtual reality software driving program that we have in the lab. So again, uh, the benefit of this is that we can manipulate every aspect of this scenario. So we can make a country setting where there's not a lot of visual distractions and have them driving at their own pace to make sure they get acclimated to the scenarios and their, their actual uh, uh, um, the instruments that they're using. And then we can go and make a fully uh, a full replica of a downtown setting with tall buildings, multiple vehicles. We can have a car jump out in front of them. We can have a ball run across. We can do anything we want. So that's the benefit of this software. Just now, what you see here is what each participant saw in their full field of view inside the magnet. And so then we came up with a design of an experiment, which is, um, as you see here, basically they would sit and look at fixation because that's, an, that's almost a control condition for us. So when the brain is settled and they're just looking at a fixation with not a lot of visual information, what areas are activated when doing that? Versus what areas are activated when doing a straight driving maneuver? And then we would mix it up with 15 seconds straight driving blocks to let the blood uh, changes kind of uh, normalize in that condition. And then we'd have them do a series of turns, right turn, left turn, and then we'd have the left turn with traffic in a busy intersection, and then a left turn with traffic and audio. And that would repeat, be repeated over a number of blocks um, to get a reliable kind of combined activation map for the 16 subjects. So here I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you now the data from those 16 subjects 
uh, that were take, taken from the MRI. So whenever you're looking at MRI, so this is the top of the skull here, and you're slowly sectioning the brain from top to bottom, where you can start to see here, if I can get my cursor, here is the cut through the eyes. So those are the eyeballs. And uh, you can see the cut is, is pretty much down to the back base of the skull, um, the cerebellum. So what you're looking at here is the average of 16 brains onto these templates. And the areas that are in color are the areas that were activated when we looked at straight driving, subtracting out our control condition of central fixation. So basically, this is the core driving network when you're just driving straight in the country. So now what we want to look at is everything from here on in is going to be subtracting from that straight driving. So from straight driving, you saw you needed the cerebellum, which helps you coordinate your motor movements. You saw that there was some motor activation, which is your hands on the steering wheel. You saw that there was some occipital or visual cortex activation, which is you looking at what you're doing. So all of that was expected, and thank goodness we found what we expected to see. But now you're going to start seeing, well, what are the results for the different driving maneuvers? So this is a, what was activated over and above driving straight. So that core network that you just saw. Now, what would be over and above to pull off a right turn in addition to the straight driving network? And you can see it's not that much more complicated than just driving straight. A right-hand turn didn't really activate much over and above. A little bit of some motor, extra motor cortex, um, seemingly the same as the straight driving. So what happens now when you make a left-hand turn? Not at a busy intersection, just a left-hand turn compared to straight driving. So you can see, looks like the left-hand turn is a little bit more difficult than a right turn, and a little bit more difficult in terms of activation or brain areas required to do it than a straight driving. So you see now this area of the brain starts to light up a fair bit in addition to what uh, uh, obviously we've, se we've seen in the straight driving condition. <coughs> So now what happens when we look at left-hand turn at a busy intersection? And we were very shocked to see that the entire brain is lighting up, <coughs> trying to pull off that maneuver. So if there's any damage, if there's any compromise, if there's any network brain changes that could be affecting the system, it's going to show up when you're doing a left-hand turn at a busy intersection. Because as you can see, you're needing a heck of a lot of brain area to pull off that maneuver. So this was quite striking for us. Now we want it to be really nasty. And as they were doing a left-hand turn at a busy intersection, I had them pretend that they were talking on a hands-free cell phone. So I just I wanted to torture each and every one of them. So that was where we got, and this is a hands-free cell phone. So their, their hands are still firmly affixed to the steering wheel. Right? This is just a disembodied voice coming into their ear. They don't have to do anything else. They're just still looking straight ahead. They're not doing anything. They're not texting or doing anything of the sort. So keep that in mind. So basically what ended up happening was, if, as you see here, this is visual cortex. So obviously there's a lot of detail in that visual scene in the left-hand turn at a busy intersection requiring a huge chunk of your visual system to fire. Basically what ended up happening was, at that point when you introduced a distracting task, having a conversation, something had to give in the brain. They were at capacity. So it ended up, what happened was, the visual cortex shut down by almost 50% and the blood was allocated to the frontal cortex, an area that wasn't online before, in order for you to have the conversation on the phone. So that's a pretty striking dynamic change with a hands-free device showing that you, at a left-hand turn at a busy intersection, are at capacity. Anything that you try to do over and above that primary task will take resources away from that. And that's exactly what we showed. Despite the fact that this was hands-free, you weren't texting, your eyes were on the road. So, so what, is, what does that mean? Well, it's something called inattention blindness. So basically, we found some of the first brain evidence about what's been known for years now, since some early eye tracking studies that I'll show you a bit about. So it's a type of cognitive distraction. And basically, what ends up happening is you're looking straight ahead. Your eyes aren't diverted from the scene. But you're looking, but absolutely not seeing. So your brain isn't processing what you're looking at. And we've all done that. You kind of have that little spacey look where some of you have now, some of you have spacey looks and I'm like, I, I'm looking at you, but you're not seeing me. You're, you're looking behind me or something. But that's the general idea, right? It is exactly that. And when you throw that into a vehicle where you're being distracted and happening as you're driving, that's a recipe for disaster without question. 
and the data has shown that hands-free, this is hands-free, not you don't have a physical cell phone uh, in your hand, that uh, they're less likely to see high and low relevant objects in their environment, visual cues like signage, traffic lights, exits, stop signs, those are pretty key things to be looking at and paying attention at when driving so as to avoid an accident. And here is a really nice study that was done by Transport Canada years, a few years ago where they had a car outfitted with, with an eye tracking device and people were in the vehicle with a hands-free device looking straight ahead and you can see without the hands-free this is the field the, their eyes darted around. Right? So they're covering the nice size of the windshield uh, with a, without a hands-free device, just in normal by tracking the eyes in the vehicle. This is actual driving. And now what happened when the hands-free cell phone was introduced, you can see the field of view went from nicely covering the windshield to this tiny, tiny section in the middle, which is all their eyes were scanning. So all the other peripheral information was gone to them. They were looking in the same area, your eyes didn't shrink, you're looking in the same area, but your scope just went from 50 or 100% to about 40%. So that's inattention blindness, and that's probably the brain, what the brain looks like that we just showed on the fMRI scans. So there's uh, several problems that I think we've, we're, we're trying to tackle. This problem is a bigger issue, I think, um, because it's assumed that hands-free is thought to be a much safer and better solution than having your hands uh, on a device. And I think that adds a little bit more risk to the, fa to the equation as well because we think, oh, I'm on a hands-free, it should be perfectly fine. I can hold a conversation the whole duration of my trip and it's fine because I don't, I'm not holding my device. But the issue still is you're distracted. Uh, so there's some questions as to if that distraction is the same as the distraction when you have a passenger and you're holding on a conversation or a good Radio Canada uh, CBC uh, talk show where you're not just passively listening to the music or conversation, you're actually actively listening as your, 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 pr your brain is processing. So are those distracting enough? Not sure. Um, but there certainly are some potential policy implications for some of, these, uh, some of this research. So then the discussion obviously comes about um, is on-road testing sufficient? So I would argue that on-road assessment, which is considered the gold standard, is probably not. And the reason being is that it's still fairly sterile. So you're going to be going on-road, and there's some question as to whether you can drive. That's why you're doing the on-road assessment. And then there's an assessor beside you. Right? They're certainly not going to be taking that individual into the worst intersection of the city and chatting in their ear or putting a hands-free device for them to use on so I'm not sure that on-road assessment is really going to uncover those situations or, or problems when the brain is distracted at that level. So there may be some benefit to using driving simulation. Nobody dies in a driving simulator. You can push the system and see what happens to the individual and what they can handle before the system shuts down. Um, mandatory age to start driving. So obviously we want that autonomy and we Desperately, I remember when I got my license, it was the greatest day ever. But I'm not that mismatch between your frontal lobes maturing, which is a lot of this stuff uh, going for distracted driving and making judgment, not maturing until your mid-20s and giving keys to people at 16, 17, there may be some mismatch there. And is there a mandatory age to stop driving? Well, not all drivers are the same. So there's a whole bunch of messy issues that uh, potentially could come up. And is it the fact that we should ban all cell phone use, anything that's distracting? So if we do that, do you make vehicles with no radios? Uh, well, I mean, at some point it becomes a bit uh, 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 ridiculous and potentially very, very difficult. I think that the take home point from this is that not all driving is the same. Left hand turn at a busy intersection is probably one of the most demanding aspects. I use a hands-free cell phone device. I commute from Toronto to Oakville every day. Uh, but if I'm in a left-hand turn into a busy, busy intersection, I almost instinctively realize that I'm going to shut down, so I turn off radio and I don't have a conversation at that point. That isn't to say you ban all cell phone use, but particularly when we know that that's one of the most demanding maneuvers, perhaps at that point you should focus, focus on the primary task at hand. 
Uh, we were lucky enough to receive some funding from the Heart and Stroke Foundation just recently to look at using this in stroke patients. And uh, we have grants in for L aging uh, and uh, uh, TBI uh, as well, traumatic brain injury. So I'll, one last thing, uh, which, was, which was funny, which this did get a bit of media coverage, and I'll just skip to uh, this, which is my favorite uh, line on, a, on an article, which is study discovers driving recipe for disaster. So again, popular media, they tend to go a little bit extreme, but I enjoyed that one quite a bit. Okay, thanks very much. going to ask if a family is uh, lawyers, then if not, you can, no. <laughs> you can actually uh, put that on YouTube, and so anybody who wants to access it from outside here, I think uh, you have to go to Microsoft, World Popular Science, YouTube, uh, you can go for Schweitzer for Tom's, and then you'll get it. Okay? Okay, so, the question, now, have, now question. so the question I have is, um, so I get about the, you know, thinking about talking about having an argument about the president, right? So you have the radio. But sometimes, you know, you find yourself driving, and you start thinking, Mm -hmm. I don't remember driving here. Mm -hmm. Is there, have you thought of, you know, anything about whether there's exercises that we can do to train ourselves, mm -hmm. the better, yeah. uh, avoid those types of activities? Yeah, so in, uh, it's funny, it's, uh, I actually have an answer for that, <laughs> which is great. Uh, the, a concrete answer, not just me uh, flapping. Uh, but we did a study a while ago that in, in frontal lobe stroke patients where they were talking exactly about, uh, about that type of thing, where they would be difficult for them to sustain attention over a period of time. They'd almost kind of go into this autopilot where you're just driving. It's not distracted in a sense that something else is happening, but you're just in autopilot mode and you're just missing your surroundings. So there's actually uh, a lot of uh, pioneering work at Baycrest Hospital, uh, where I, I used to work, and uh, by Brian Levine, and it's called Goal Management Training. It's actually a whole cognitive rehabilitation program for exactly that. Yes, thank you for the presentation. I just turned 79, and I realized I have a 2010 Toyota Corolla for sale. Yeah, so I think that's a very, very good question. I think the teenage application is probably not as relevant because there's a maturation process that has to occur in parallel with that, right? So could it help? Potentially, yes. The studies that we're trying to do right now with colleagues at Baycrest are to look at patients with mild cognitive impairment. So that's the precursor to dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Can we actually train them, rehab them without medication so that they can actually drive better longer? That's where we're working on right now for that group. The teenage group, the younger group, as to what's needed to kind of get over that hump in parallel with the maturing frontal lobe that you can't expedite, <laughs> I'm not sure, but that's a very, very good question. Great. Other questions? So, Tom, how about in the operating room? So, I'm a surgeon. Um, when I'm operating, should I have music in the background? Should it be ACDC? Should it be classical? Yep. Um, Again, a very good question. So when I was, uh, was studying um, you know, for exams, I could not have any music on. But my friends uh, would study at uh, the, uh, the library at University of Waterloo, and they could have music blaring in their ears. It's a personal preference thing. I think we know our limitations. I know that, if, again, it's a real example for me. If I'm driving and making, uh, or in a new environment, and I'm making a left-hand turn to a busy intersection, I go to the point of actually shutting my radio off. Because I don't want any distracting information at that point. I, I certainly don't answer a phone. But, you know, uh, maybe that's just because I'm not as smart. <laughs> you so, know? so um, can you apply the use of the fMRI into the operating room environment? Yeah. Training, the distractions, looking at you know, 
mm -hmm. train better and faster? Yeah, so there is, a, there is a lot of research or another arm of the research that we're doing using this technology uh, in, in or using this kind of techniques, virtual reality in fMRI is looking at laparoscopic surgery performance, which is a very, uh, very uh, bimanual coordinated uh, uh, task in sur for surgical um, excision of, of, you would be able to speak to it better, but uh, removing, um, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> The organs, but the, the gallbladder, gallbladder and other organs like that. Uh, but it's a difficult task to learn. So we actually tried to figure out, well, is there a way that you can image and put this into the fMRI to see, is, is there something going on in a certain subgroup of trainees that can't quite do it? Regardless on how much training they have, they just can't quite get that bimanual coordination. So we did a, a preliminary study showing that we could put a laparoscopic training device in the fMRI and hopefully the next series of studies will be exactly that, being able to help select certain trainees. Uh, there's other technology that we're getting, which is wireless EEG. So hopefully Theodore Grantroff is another surgeon in, uh, in surgery here. Uh, and um, having him wear this device, which will get readings off the brain as he's performing surgery, will give us also an indication as to what happens in the OR environment. Is music or any voice or, or any other uh, noise distracting? Uh, is there a way that we can predict errors before they occur because the brain will fire and in advance of that? So it's a whole other field for sure. Okay. Uh, questions back there. Oh, uh, great presentation. I just want to know if like, society is so resistant to the fact of turning off music while we drive, is there like a specific type of music that would correlate to having a minor risk of accidents while they're driving? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. sorry. No, no, you go. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good question. So I think one of the things I probably didn't articulate was that the thing with music is that we can passively listen to music, right? You're not listening to, unless you're a musician, uh, you're not listening to every note, you're not listening to every lyric all the time. So you can just kind of sit back and still remain quite focused on the primary task, even with that information in the background. The difference, I think, occurs when you're starting to listen to maybe talk radio or something like that, which is for you to be able to follow along in an intellectual conversation, you actually have to listen to the words. You can't passively um, listen to the uh, conversation. So I think there is a bit of a distinction. We haven't done any research to show if different types of music, yeah. whatever, because you can technically shut it off, yeah. although you're still perceiving it. You can, also, you can also come down to Don Valley Park and young people are competing with each other you know, stripping from lane to lane, and you get all of that stuff too, yeah. right? So that, that's, a, that's an extremely important point because when you're sitting in a left-hand turn at a busy intersection in my driving simulator, you don't necessarily have that anxiety that, oh, there's a guy flipping me the bird behind, honking the horn, go already, right? If you now factor that into it, that's a whole different ballgame. Now you've got all these areas firing in your brain and now you're anxious. Right? Uh, it's an unbelievably uh, difficult uh, situation to be in. Yep? Um, I don't know if this is um, relevant, but when I came to Canada, I had been away from school for a year. So I wanted to take psychology. And I had all kinds of music behind me. I couldn't study. I had to read the page maybe five, six times. So I did very soft classical music. I got honors. Mm -hmm. I could understand what I was reading, and I kept it in my head. Mm -hmm. Is that what it's? Well, yeah, I mean, again, it's 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 personal. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's personal preference. I know a lot of people for relaxing purposes. Uh, you know, a lot of surgeons actually do have classical music because it's semi-soothing. Um, I don't know. What do you do? Do you have any music? Anything in your in the operating room? Not you. Not usually. Yeah. Some people don't. Some people have classical music. I have yet to hear somebody playing Guns N' Roses or anything like that. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, hard metal, hard rock music in the background, no, making them all aggressive, <laughs> cutting like crazy. Even so. even with words, you know, sounds I couldn't. Yeah. I had to read six, seven times the page. I couldn't understand. Yeah. When I had soft music, the brain was working like crazy. Yeah. And I had to understand everything. I got honors. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably good. Yeah, so I, I think um, that, that's a very good question. I, can't, I don't have the direct kind of brain answer for that. 
but I can speculate that as you, as you travel more familiar routes, it becomes easier, right? But in the flip side, you may actually take advantage of that easier and think you could do more secondary distracting tasks as a result. So I think there's a catch-22 there. Um, but it, it, there is no doubt, um, you know, driving the same familiar route over and over, as long as something doesn't jump out at you or it doesn't distract you or anything like that, it probably will get easier and easier. It's the taking advantage of that, thinking you have more resources to do something else, that would be the danger. Okay, question, uh, the question of comments, uh, comments and responses to the discussion. So I, I think studies have shown that like, even, even if you're not actively listening to like, a song in English, you still passively process that. It does take some attention. But apparently, listening to a classical song or a song in another language is like, equal. It doesn't take away your attention as much as it and my question is that uh, when I look at your simulator, it shows that we're on our back while we're doing this. How different do you think that is from actually driving upright or I don't know, circulation might be different or yeah, so I don't, it's not going to affect uh, much of the perfusion changes as a result of, of firing in the brain. So that isn't an issue. The issue, though, uh, we, we will be faced with that issue when we're going to have elderly patients running through our studies. Because that is absolutely not a naturalistic position to be in. Uh, we're going to need more training. So every subject that went through between the ages of 25 or, or 30, what I had there, did a practice session, which is we have a mock-up MRI where they actually did that over and over again to get familiar and comfortable in that seated position like that. So it, didn't, it wouldn't have changed much in terms of blood perfusion in the brain, but it is a novel, unnatural type of thing. But the benefit that we have is that it's across the board for everybody, right? Yep. I think there's one behind. Do you expect to then, I guess, if you're going to start doing any work with the elderly, because of um, arteriosclerosis and a lot of reduction of flexibility of arteries, that you're going to have uh, a delayed onset of blood supply being applied. So do you have any sense of how that will work out? Like, do you have reaction time and yeah. all that? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, it, it's again, we're going to be having uh, most of those risk factors controlled for. Uh, so somebody with, uh, you know, high elevated cholesterol, ele elevated blood pressure will potentially have those issues and actually uh, translates into something called white matter disease in the brain. We'll actually be screening for that to making sure so that we do f what we do find is actually related to the task at hand rather than a pathophysiological change in the brain for normal, healthy aging, so that, but that is a good question. That doesn't necessarily translate into a lag, uh, like an extra lag. Uh, it, uh, it does potentially translate into reduction of brain areas recruited, right? So we want to do our best to control those factors as much as possible. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Can you say it again? In the simulator, yep. is there plans if there isn't already to have a rear view mirror? Because that's a lot of additional information that you yeah. can process through, especially when changing the things that are like in the behind you or something. That's part of the simulator, like, show yes, they said on the brakes, but they didn't show that the person behind you is the other end of the So, I mean, th that's a very good point. We wanted to try to keep it as <laughs> straightforward and simple as possible the first go at it. There's lots of things that we can add. Um, the surprising thing for us was still the huge amount of brain despite not having all that other information. So you could only assume that, if anything, it would be more as a result of extra information needed to be processed. Right? But it's a, a very good point. We just haven't done that. Psychologically altered, meaning like some mental health issues. Yep. Yeah. There's there's no doubt. I think the gentleman back there made a made a very good point in terms of the one thing we couldn't induce is that anxiousness, that anxiety, which I know would wreak havoc for anybody. And I'd be very curious to see. We just can't replicate that in the magnet. Uh, but there is no doubt. And one of the things that we want to look at is um, uh, finding out what medication use will actually do to driving. 
So people with antidepressants, on antidepressants, does that actually change your ability to drive or the brain chemistry or the, the uh, brain perfusion that we see on the scans? We have not looked at patients that are not medicated or any other mental health, but especially with things like, uh, you know, certain things like chronic treatment-resisted depression or things of that nature, that actually changes the brain as well. So we expect that there be different, oops, different activation patterns seen as well. Okay, so I, th I think our time is up. Just a couple of uh, last remarks. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming today. I think we had a great talk from Tom, and uh, I think this is a really good example of how uh, research done at an extremely fundamental level, a basic level, can have uh, real-life implications, and I think that that's what we like to do with all